afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shetachukwu Guame. I'm a first year PhD student in the Urban Education Doctoral Program. And I'm pleased to bring to you today, uh, this month's uh, Lunch and Learn from the Center of Urban Education. The Center of Urban Education at the University of Pittsburgh, we love hosting these talks because it's a way for us to bring visiting scholars and uh, showcase their work and have them exchange ideas with us and have us really critically think about what it means to uh, critically assess education. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Russell Rickford. Dr. Russell Rickford is an associate professor at Cornell University uh, who studies history. He specializes in African-American political culture after World War II, the Black radical tradition, and transnational social movements. Uh, his most recent book, We Are an African People, Independent Education, Black Power and the Radical Imagination has received 2016 Hooks Institute National Book Award and the 2016 OAH Liberty Legacy Foundation Award. Today, Dr. Rickford will be here discussing with us his recent book, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Russell Rickford. During this talk, please uh, add questions in our chat function as after Dr. Rickford's talk is over, we will have a Q&A session where I will moderate. So please participate with us and ask very informative questions. Without any further ado, Dr. Russell Rickford. Thanks so much, uh, comrade. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you. Um, I'm gonna try my best with this technology here, so bear with me. And I think that my job now is to share my screen. So hold on one second. Go to PowerPoint. All right, can you see my PowerPoint? Okay, okay, good. Um, all right, let's see. All right. Um, so again, thanks so much to uh, Professor Dancy, to to Cassia, to Sueno, to to Shalegra, to the Heinz Fellows, to all the other folks. Um, who helped to organize and uh, participate this. I'm delighted uh, to be with you. I'm gonna uh, begin with a, a quote from the West African uh, revolutionary Emil Carr, Cabral. Uh, in 65, Cabral said, keep always in mind that the people are not fighting for ideas, for the things in anyone's head. They're fighting for material benefits to live better and in peace national liberation and independence will remain meaningless for the people unless it brings a real improvement in conditions of life. Uh, the Pan-African nationalist renaissance of the late 60s, early 70s generated an incredibly fertile institutional life, part of a larger outpouring of theory and cultural production that changed African-American politics. Contemporary flourishing of grassroots activity included crusades to remake Black America through a conversion from Negro to African. Attempts to construct what I call the African American post colony, a projected condition of cultural and political sovereignty, were central to that quest. Pan African nationalism was an approach that combined concepts of Black American nationhood with commitment to linking Black struggles worldwide. The young activist intellectuals who embraced this political tendency devoted themselves to re-socializing, to re-socializing the oppressed. Independent schools were to serve as the primary instruments of conversion. Pan-African nationalist schools were counter institutions designed to counteract white cultural hegemony. They strove not simply to bolster the academic skills and self-image, of urban African-American youth, but also to decolonize minds, to nurture the next generation of activists and to embody the principles of self-determination and African identity. The establishment stemmed from the premise that African-Americans were a subjugated nation, an internal colony that needed to claim intellectual and cultural sovereignty before achieving true liberation through formal statehood or community self-rule. Operators of Pan-African nationalist schools believed a quasi-colonial education had depersonalized African-Americans 
preparing them for subservience in much the same way that European empires had denatured their non-white subjects. The rise of Pan-African nationalist schools in the late 60s signaled a strategic and philosophical shift from the pursuit of reform within a liberal democracy to the attempt to build the prospective infrastructure for an independent black nation, an entity that activists imagined as a political and spiritual extension of the revolutionary third world. Creators of Pan-African nationalist schools were veterans of 1960s struggles who had rediscovered the principle that black people could develop alternatives to the oppressive social institutions that dominated their lives. The schools reflected a search for indigenous structures that could strengthen and expand elements of self-determination within deteriorating urban centers. So my book, We Are an African People, does not emphasize classroom experiences uh, within such institutions. Instead, it seeks to understand the role of Pan-African nationalist schools as organs of radical political imagination and as efforts to fashion a new peoplehood through the transformation of consciousness. So I'm less interested in formal uh, pedagogical practices as I am in larger questions of philosophy and, and praxis, right? How these political ideas uh, were enacted. Um, organizers of Pan-African National Schools understood citizenship as a cultural construct. These theorists believed white supremacy remained the central reality of black existence throughout the world though post-war struggles had expanded the scope of legal equality and civil rights. For contemporary black militants, cultivating an alternative citizenship or counter-citizenship, a sense of transnational belonging that defied the cultural norms and political dictates of American empire was a vital means of combating the psychology of the oppressed, a syndrome described by thinkers from Frantz Fanon to Malcolm X. We Are an African People describes a moment in which cadres of activist intellectuals saw rethinking schools in poor and working class African American communities as a way to redeem the process of formal learning, but also as a way to pursue and to perform and even prefigure black cultural and political sovereignty. Uh, okay, some background. Let's see if I can advance this slide here. Um, by the mid 60s, organizers of Southern Freedom Schools and other young activists were entering a new phase of struggle. The intellectual shift from freedom to liberation signaled a transition from efforts to redeem American democracy to attempts to arm the oppressed with the tools of self-government. Freedom evoked the civil rights ideal of equality before the law. Liberation, on the other hand, implied an uncompromising embrace of self-rule. Malcolm X's organization of Afro-American unity had called the Harlem Weekend School that it had established in 1964 a liberation school. The institution reflected the OAAU's global outlook, its indictment of US imperialism, and its solidarity with progressive African nations. Uh, the staff members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, or SNCC, exemplified the transition to an insurgent politics of liberation. The genesis of many Pan-African nationalist institutions can be traced um, to the dissolution of SNCC in the late 1960s. Former SNCC workers emerged from the Southern desegregation movement and scattered to various cities, North and South. Looking to stimulate a transformation of consciousness, they and other battle-tested activists returned to the arena of education, refining theories of liberation pedagogy drawn from the experiences in freedom schools, black studies campaigns, and student protests. Such organizers continued to embrace the proposition that an entire school system can be created in any community outside the official order and critical of its suppositions. However, no longer preoccupied with the moral redemption of America, they adopted organizing strategies designed to revolutionize black culture and consciousness. All right, parallel institutions. Parallel institutions seem capable of offering an alternative structure of authority, a provisional power that could replace hostile and inadequate local agencies 
and restore some of the social services that were vanishing from the urban core amid the cutbacks and disinvestment of the late 60s and 70s. By presenting credible alternatives that fulfilled human need, such ventures could win the loyalty of the people, expose the failings of the existing social apparatus, and serve as tools for mass politicization. Pan-African nationalists viewed national liberation as the answer to the political, economic, and cultural subordination of African Americans. Uh, the 1960s was an age of independence when liberation struggles in Africa, the Caribbean, and other parts of the third world culminated in the birth of new nation states. The great wave of post-World War II revolutions seemed to affirm formal self-government as the essential solution to the dependency of subject peoples. But was nationhood the optimal model of Black self-determination in the US. By the late 60s, some Pan-African nationalists were reassessing their veneration of the nation state and their wholesale embrace of post-colonial governments. Uh, the ouster of Nkrumah in Ghana uh, the eruption of civil strife in Nigeria, the brutal reign of Amin in Uganda, uh, and a series of other conflicts and crises across the continent and the Caribbean underscored the shortcomings of national independence. A decade or more of political independence had failed to bring real self-determination to former subject people. Third world nations had won formal authority, what the Tanzanian statesman Julius Nyeri called flag independence, but entire sectors of their economies remained in the grasp of foreign capital. Indeed, the disintegration of European empires had set the stage for new forms of exploitation. Stagnation, repression, and neo-colonialism drained the exuberance of the early 1960s wave of African independence. Some African-American militants denounced the new crop of African and Caribbean rulers as stooges who continued to take orders from Washington, London, Paris, and et cetera. So I, ju I just want to note here as an aside um, that the, because I'm not uh, really talking much about the Black Panthers today, but I do want to note that the Black Panthers were among the most caustic critics of narrow conceptions of Black nationalism. Um, so as uh, the Panther leader Huey Newton declared, how can we be Black nationalists when the US is not a nation, but an empire. So the Panthers embraced the theory of intercommunalism as a means of understanding the global nature of oppression. So intercommunalism posited African-Americans as only one of many communities around the world suffering under US imperialism. And the theory suggested that the real objective of freedom struggles um, around the world was not individual nationhood, but the decisive defeat of, uh, of imperialism. So if formal independence had not truly emancipated the disinherited masses of the third world, national sovereignty seemed equally problematic as a framework for black American liberation. Um, even dissident and embryonic models of black nationhood exhibited what revolutionary philosopher Frantz Fanon called the pitfalls of national consciousness. Fanon believed nationalism was a double-edged sword. Um, while it enabled the consolidation of liberation forces during the anti-colonial phase of struggle, it also brought to power an elite class of post-colonial managers committed to governing in its own narrow self-interest. Black American concepts of nationality proved equally problematic. On one hand, the reinvigoration of nationalist consciousness significant, significantly enhanced the post-war African-American mass movement, raising questions of power and autonomy that had been sidelined amid the push for desegregation. The 1960s Black nationalist resurgence 
highlighted the strategic limitations of liberal reform and white paternal benevolence. It helped black activists transcend the Cold War framework of race relations and recognize white supremacy as a system of global conquest. Revolutionary black nationalism encouraged dissidents to link the subjugation of African-American communities to international processes of domination and underdevelopment. But as feminist scholar Anne McClintock reminds us, quote, all nationalisms are gendered, all are invented, and all are dangerous, unquote. Regardless of the color of its progenitors, a nation state serves to discipline and regiment its subjects, subordinating to the national mission more organic notions of community and social belonging. Pan-African nationalist institutions in the US occasionally mirrored the hierarchies and dogmatism of the ruling parties and post-colonial regimes they sought to emulate. Attempts to quote unquote govern consciousness and to control behavior replicated the patriarchal centralized authority of the post-colonial state, elevating the prerogatives of putative authorities over the aspirations of the governed. Cultural autonomy was equated with the activities and theories of the self-identified vanguard forces of African-American liberation, rather than understood as a product of democratic struggle from below. Uh, most people are not rational, or they are just rational. Intellectual and organizer Amiri Baraka declared in 1969, explaining Pan-African nationalism's attempt to regulate the black rank and file. Quote, they function on a less than conscious level. The reason you have to teach people values, values, values is so they will do things that are in their best interest without trying to reason about it. Unquote. Thankfully, there emerged a more egalitarian ideal for conceptualizing the African-American post-colony. In the late 60s and 70s, solidarity with armed struggles against the remaining outposts of European colonial domination in Southern Africa increasingly influenced Pan-Africanist politics in the US. Some US militants believed Southern Africa's liberation movements would elevate the entire third world, eclipsing the significance of the earlier wave of nationalist campaigns. Armed struggles raging in the southern tip of the continent ruled by Portuguese, South African, and Rhodesian re regimes served as emblems of revolutionary commitment within the US. Emphasis on revolutionary politics eclipsed more sentimental modes of Pan-African nationalist thought. According to a dominant political line, what linked Black Americans and Africans was not simply race, or cultural heritage, but the fact that their oppression sprang from the same global structures of exploitation. Quote, you can't understand what's going on in North Carolina until you understand what's going on in Zimbabwe, unquote, organizers of the Durham chapter of the African Liberation Support Committee proclaimed. If the purpose of revolution was to produce a change in the conditions of living, as Angolan freedom fighter Agostino Neto asserted, then engagement with Southern Africa could help transform Black American realities as well. As Black polemicists shifted their focus from the process of national formation in the developing world to active guerrilla campaigns against white minority rule, the concept of liberated territories began to rival the motif of nationhood as a touchstone for radical African-American consciousness. Quote, we are citizens of Africa, an Atlanta-based Pan-African nationalist publication declared in 1970. Quote, we have to work with other African people to build liberated zones, which can emerge into the new Africa of the 21st century. In his book, Freedom Dreams, I was just talking about this with some of the Heinz fellas. In his book, I gave him some uh, homework. In his book, Freedom Dreams, the noted black radical historian, Robin D.G. Kelly, 
recalls that as a young radical growing up in Harlem, he searched, quote, for glimmers of a new society in the liberated zones of Portugal's African colony, colonies during the wars of independence. Liberated territories were those rural areas that armed insurgents in places like Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau had wrested from the grasp of colonialists and white settler regimes. Similar zones in South Vietnam and other lands had long captured the imagination of the anti-war activists associated with the multiracial new left. The escalation of armed struggle in Southern Africa and the Portuguese colonies shifted attention from post-colonial regimes to ongoing battles against the vestiges of colonialism. Recognition of the political and theoretical significance of liberated territories increased among African-American activists after fall 1971, when key US Pan-Africanists, key up the next slide here, uh, key US Pan-Africanists, including Owusu Sadaki, uh, Howard Fuller, of North Carolina's Malcolm X Liberation University and the New York City uh, and civil rights worker, Robert uh, Van Leerop. Um, Van Leerop is a, is a taller uh, fellow there on the right uh, holding something. Um, uh, visited emancipated portions of Mozambique and spent several weeks embedded with local guerrilla forces. This act of solidarity led to the production of Aluta Continua, Van Leerop's 1972 documentary film about the Mozambican struggle. Aluta Continua helped raise African-American awareness about the fight against Portuguese colonialism, as did US visits by Amilcar Cabral, the respected leader of Guinea-Bissau's uh, anti-colonial struggle, um, the 1972 creation of uh, annual uh, African Liberation Day demonstrations in the US um, and other solidarity activities, uh, including boycotts. Well publicized accounts of life inside rebel health swaths of Southern Africa further established the concept of liberated areas as an important archetype of black self-determination. No longer simply an abstract metaphor, the territories assume deeper concrete meaning in many progressive African-American circles. In published testimonies about his experiences traversing the Mozambican interior with members of that country's liberation front, Ousu Sadaki explained that the fighters were laboring to emancipate, quote, not just their land, but the man on it. Sadaki described in great detail his trek through the Mozambican countryside and his exposure to the rigors of revolutionary practice. At one encampment, he witnessed the organization of a, of a makeshift school. He later recalled that, quote, a freedom fighter, one day out of combat with the Portuguese, will put up a blackboard on a tree and with his gun still strapped over his shoulder, begin to teach these young brothers and sisters. Sadoki re recounted how the guerrillas had created makeshift hospitals for the benefit of poor villagers, including peasants who had lacked access to basic services under colonialism. Sadoki's report highlighted not the workings of a military dictatorship, but the efforts of an armed cadre closely integrated with the lives of ordinary civilians and devoted to their dignity and well being. Screenings of Aluta Continua reinforced this perspective. And again, this is uh, uh, Robert Ben Lerop's um, uh, film. Um, uh, Aluta Continua, or The Struggle Continues, were the words with, 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 with which Eduardo Mondelein, Frilimo's first president, ended his letters. The documentary Aluta Continua traveled the circuits of black consciousness groups in the US. The film depicted Mozambique's guerrilla forces as a courageous people's army, a body that viewed revolutionary leadership as a sacred responsibility rather than as a rank or a privilege. In 
The principle of liberated territories promised to expand the creative social possibilities of Pan-African nationalist practice in the US. What were the implications of viewing Black American communities not simply as colonies awaiting national liberation, but as zones of insurgent democracy. The main concern under the latter schema, which is to say under the liberated territory schema, was laying the foundation of the new society rather than anticipating the formation of a national bureaucracy. The quest was to prefigure, not the apparatus of a nation state, but the democratic social relations of a radically just community. A territory is inchoate and, and contested. It is uh, underdeveloped, it is full of possibility. Most importantly, it is in flux. And its structures, its mechanisms of governance and distribution remain fluid and may be molded by indigenous inhabitants. A liberated territory must produce the foundations of the new society, but it must do so on the people's terms. Rather than merely anticipate national formation, it must prefigure the democratic relations demanded by the peasants and workers who inhabit the territory. The concept of liberated zones suggested that the development of alternative educational models could help guide the reconstruction of society, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. Rather than instill loyalty to an unborn nation, indigenous institutions can empower children and young adults to craft a post-revolutionary future of their own design. Rather than attempt to forge a disciplined political vanguard, right, long a preoccupation of leftists, grassroots organizers could immediately begin laying the practical foundations of the new society as rebel fighters were doing overseas. Rather than replicate a national bureaucracy or claim an absolute revolutionary mandate, human rights workers could wage a permanent struggle to win the trust of the people. Teachers and leaders would fight alongside the popular masses, taking pains to avoid reproducing colonial dynamics and prioritizing the improvement of quotidian life over the ascent to formal self-rule. Rigid gender roles would dissolve, enabling women and men to wield equal authority and perform identical tasks in the struggle. Uh, on the marches, uh, Owusu Sadaki had recounted in 1972, there is no place for weak need male chauvinism. Revolution would be seen not just as a bid for power or control, but as a dynamic process of constant change. The definition advanced in Aluta Continua. I, I, you know, I'm sure we'll get into this some more in the uh, Q&A. I don't at all want to um, hold out liberated territories as a kind of panacea, as a sort of perfect ideal or framework or, or model. I'm just, I just want to sort of point to some of the, what I see as the kind of emancipatory um, impulses within this, um, within this ideal. Um, community activists would strive to creatively address the everyday needs of workers and the unemployed, demonstrating on a modest scale the structural transformation that the entire society needed to undergo. In the liberated territories of black neighborhoods, the social value of all labor would be honored and rewarded. Decision-making would occur in people's assemblies. Changes in the status and material realities of the poor and the oppressed would serve as critical measures of revolutionary progress. Socialism would be understood not as an advanced form of statecraft, but as acts of self-organization that put oppressed people in command of their lives. The purpose of revolution was not to govern consciousness, or control behavior. It was not to create a new layer of political elites or to replicate the centralized authority of the nation state. It was not to Africanize exploitation by replacing white bosses with black bosses. The purpose of revolution was to return dignity and decision-making power to the people. Meaningful post-coloniality required the construction of a new order based on qualitative changes in the lives of the laboring classes. Revolution was not an event, it was a process. Freedom could not be orchestrated from above, it had to be engineered from below. All right, just to wrap up. Um, 
Many grassroots black formations pursued elements of this vision during and after the 1970s, from liberation schools to urban survival programs to radical feminist groups. If national liberation remained the dominant uh, black radical discourse, an array of political actors sought more humanistic models of social reconstruction and revolutionary practice. Today, strands of this creative utopianism have resurfaced within autonomous struggles like Black Lives Matter. Young activists are again creating alternative institutions from communal urban gardens to agricultural cooperatives designed to prefigure a more humane economy. And here I have a, a image from Cooperation Jackson, um, which is a collective, um, a movement in Jackson, Mississippi. We can talk a little bit more about that in Q&A. Um, many activists are doing so, are creating these models based upon a democratic worldview that explicitly rejects patriarchy, heterosexism, and monopoly capitalism. They're calling for the eradication of white supremacy, as well as the basic transformation of social and economic relations something that neither the post-colonial world nor the post-segregation era had managed to deliver. So I think part of the appeal of thinking beyond nations is to recognize the ways in which both um, formal independence in the third world and formal legal equality, right, within the United States failed to deliver on their promises of, of democracy and equality. Armed with their own revolutionary frameworks, these activists, these young activists are struggling to reclaim their humanity and build a new society within the shell of the old. Despite the social misery caused by COVID, uh, the pandemic has also offered creative new possibilities for grassroots self-activity, spawning mutual aid projects in many communities. But we must continue to guard against internal contradictions. We cannot merely carve out safe zones for the practice of identity. We cannot merely pursue specialized lifestyles within the framework of capitalism. Grassroots expressions of cooperation and solidarity cannot be separated from struggles to construct a more truly egalitarian society. We must strive to reorganize relations within our institutions and our communities, even as we pursue larger visions of liberation. Long after the tides of black power radicalism receded, marginalized Americans continued to imagine the schoolhouse as a site of political empowerment and self-determination. Education remains an arena of struggle. We still need radical democratic spaces in which people of all colors can craft and practice theories of social reconstruction. Today, as many parents, students, and activists strive to reimagine schools that have long stood as sites of civic abandonment and criminalization, a re-examination of traditions of educational dissent may prove invaluable. And I wanna leave it there, but I, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, and I'm gonna ask my, uh, my stewards here whether they think I have time to show a few minutes of this video. I can, I'd like to show about seven minutes, but I can, um, I can cut it a bit short if necessary. So someone just give me the sign. Yes, you have time, Professor Dancy said. Okay, good. I was hoping you were gonna say that. <laughs> All right, hold on a second, I gotta share your screen again. Can you see that? Okay. Um, all right. In 1962, Prelimo was organized by the merger of three separate nationalist organizations. In the course of the struggle, Prelimo has become more than just a front. It is a military and political institution, but it is also an educational institution, an agricultural institution, a health institution, and a social services institution. 
In the course of the armed struggle, Prelimo has become a revolutionary party of the masses of Mozambicans. Leadership is based upon a concept of responsibility rather than rank. The leaders are called responsables, which in English literally means the responsibles. If one were asked to identify the leadership or policy makers of Prolimo, one need merely point to any school teacher, any peasant engaged in agricultural production, or any group of children laughing and playing in the liberated areas. In working for a common goal, people have learned to submerge their own individual egos, and individuals do not assume positions of responsibility with an idea that he or she has inherited the position of prestige or power on an individual basis. Very often, people are reassigned to different jobs in different areas of responsibility, as Frelimo strives to put people who are best able to perform in specific jobs. In this revolution, there is no distinction made in the tasks one is called upon to perform strictly because of a person's sex or age. The people of Mozambique are waging a protracted people's war. It is a protracted struggle in that it is comparable to a long-distance relay race rather than a sprint. In this sense, the revolution is a process and not an event. Polimo's main weapons are the people of Mozambique themselves, their unity and their political consciousness. In many of the traditional societies, as in most societies, particularly under colonialism, women were assigned an inferior status. They drew water, gathered wood, and bore children. Men were the warriors and the herders of cattle, jobs to which considerable prestige was attached. Today in the liberated areas of Mozambique, the Frelimo guerrilla army sets an example of mobilization and effective utilization of all components. No job is performed only by men or only by women. Men and women engage in various aspects of military activities. Men and women serve as teachers and medical cadre. Men and women cook, sew, and perform other housekeeping chores. Naturally, these changes did not occur overnight, and the process of change in the status of women is continuing. In 1967, the first group of women began full-scale political and military training in order to make them more capable of fulfilling whatever task the revolution might require. In some areas, the people were literally amazed to see women in uniforms, carrying weapons, and functioning as part of a disciplined command structure. Mozambique are the first to say that they still have a way to go in changing the status of women, just as they have a long way to go in all other aspects of the struggle. However, revolution must be viewed as a dynamic process with constant change, just as a long-distance relay team gets stronger and stronger each day of application, and just as the seeds of a mango tree undergo a change from seeds to tree, getting stronger and more firmly rooted in the process, so too grows the revolution in Mozambique and all of its changes and dynamics. school in large numbers for the very first time. The life which they grow into 
will be very different from that which older women ruined. Mm. One of Prolimo's first priorities has been education. The first president of Prolimo, Eduardo Munlan, who was assassinated by Portuguese agents in 1969, had this to say about education. We have always attached such great importance to education because, in the first place, it is essential for the development of our struggle since the involvement and support of the population increase as the understanding of the situation grows. In the second place, a future independent Mozambique will be in very grave need of educated citizens to lead the way in development. In the liberated areas, primary or elementary schools were established with very basic materials. Where classrooms exist, they are built by the students and teachers themselves out of the materials found in the forest or bush. For the first time, students are being taught very basic skills, how to read and write, how to add and subtract, something about themselves and their country. They learn about Africa, its past, its present, and its future. Every day in their lives, the future of Mozambique and the rest of Africa is being shaped. In their lives, education is not a way for them to achieve upward mobility or isolate themselves as an intellectual elite, nor is it a meaningless abstraction which leads to dependence upon external economics. Instead, they are learning these basic skills so that they can teach others of their people the same skills. Plus, in their daily lives, they know the importance of being able to count the number of soldiers, planes, and bombs that the enemy uses. Even though there are no expensive school buildings or other such facilities, the work of education goes forward, as the most important components of any school are students willing to learn, teachers willing to teach, and a common motivation to achieve a common goal or objective. The students and teachers work together in this respect. When school is out, the teachers do not go one way into cars for a trip home to exclusive suburbs, while the students go another way deeper into a ghetto. Instead, they are all part of the same mass movement, and the teachers live, work, and struggle in the bush with all of the people. You will never hear of teachers from Fralimo striking because they've been asked to perform so-called non-professional duties. You will never hear of teachers from Fralimo striking over issues which affect only their own economic interests at the expense of the community. You will never hear of students or teachers being disrespectful of each other or assaulting each other. No one is a specialist, and in the course of the struggle, everyone is called upon to perform many tasks. Okay, maybe we should uh, end it there so we have time for some Q&A. Let me stop the share and uh, turn it back over to my um, fearless uh, handlers here. Okay, um, let's start with the questions. So our first question for you, Dr. Rickford, in the chat, it says, in dispelling the rigid gender roles, the deliberated, uh, the deliberated territories movement seek out the history of gender expansiveness in the African society's pre-colonialism. And what are our obligations today to centering LGBTQ experiences and struggles in activism work? That's a great, great question. I wish I could see folks. This is <laughs> um, but uh, well, it's, uh, I guess that such is the age of COVID. Um, uh, well, I think there's actually a complicated answer to that. And I think that there are many scholars who um, probably answered this question much better than uh, I did in uh, in this book, We Are an African People. I mean, I think one of my own critiques of this book is that it didn't fully flesh out. There is a critique of, um, of patriarchy uh, within the book, uh, but there, I, I feel like I could have fleshed out more my um, uh, critique of, of gender uh, and how, and blind spots and how that uh, undermined um, the, liberatory potential of some of these movements. You know, I, I want to uh, clarify that the um, sort of influence of, you know, liberated territories as a, a framework um, was not necessarily 
explicit. I mean, quite often it was explicit, right? I, I gave you a few uh, examples of sort of references to, um, uh, to liberated zones, but it was more the sort of influence of Southern Africa and Southern African freedom struggles more broadly. Um, and the understanding of how armed struggle, you know, a veneration of armed struggle, not just as a kind of um, adventurist, you know, sort of ultra militant, you know, embrace of, uh, of revolutionary violence, but rather um, as, an, uh, as an attempt to transcend uh, reformism um, uh, and a kind of a growing awareness of the ways in which the um, liberation struggles, particularly in the liberated zones, um, were helping to forge a, a genuinely new society and the ways in which this really went beyond the kind of transition, the sort of formal transition from uh, colonialism um, to self-government um, that you know, almost the entire African continent had undergone at this point to very mixed results, right? Um, um, you know, the sort of neo-colonial um, uh, relationships remained, right? Um, I think that there's no question, I, you know, we talk a lot about the kind of hyper-masculinism and the patriarchy within uh, Black power, or within Black freedom struggles more broadly. And I, I don't think that that can be underestimated. Uh, um, I do think that, and, and you know, my book tries to uh, chronicle what I see as a shift um, um, from, a more sort of explicitly patriarchal black nationalism and pan-Africanism, pan-African nationalism, as, as, as we said, um, to more sort of expansive um, and, and radical and genuinely liberatory uh, approaches. And I think that there were a, num a number of the sort of historical figures that I chronicle in the book did undergo this um, this transition. It didn't mean that they, you know, purged themselves um, of sexism um, or, you know, a lot of these ideas, which are, of course, deeply embedded within our society. It means that I think for many of them, um, they were trying to think seriously about liberation and what liberation entailed. Um, and as they, um, learn more about um, freedom struggles and quite often interacted with um, freedom fighters from uh, you know from across the world um, they uh, increasingly realized that um, revolution meant rethinking everything right rethinking all of our social relations re rethinking our economic relations rethinking the relations of production uh, rethinking um, the distribution of, of sources, um, rethinking health, uh, you know, rethinking every exchange um, in our society, rethinking the base, the economic base, the material base, and rethinking the superstructure and the cultural apparatus as well. Um, and that brought them into conflict with some of the obvious contradictions of male supremacy, right? Um, and for some as well, heterosexism, right? So the Black Panthers is a, is a good example of this. I think that if you read the scholarship of, um, of uh, Ashley Farmer, um, of Robin Spencer, that's Robin with a Y, um, and other, um, you know, sort of experts on, uh, on Black women and gender within the Black power movement, um, this will be much more fleshed out. Um, and as for today, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously the struggles for um, the basic human rights and basic recognition um, uh, of trans people is, is obviously at the top of the news. Um, and, you know, again, I think that there's always narrow ways in which, you know, capitalism encourages us to see these as kind of individual struggles, as struggles just for identity, but they're not struggles for identity. The struggles for liberation. I mean, I don't want to discount identity, right? We struggle for uh, to express identity, but ultimately, 
we have to build a kind of society where everybody has the capacity to express themselves freely, um, not just freely in a kind of narrow liberal Western sense, but to really uh, realize their full human potential, right? Um, and that's a question of identity, but it's also a question of resources. It's a question of, uh, it's a larger question of emancipation and humanity. So the next question for you, Dr. Rickford, is what do you think your work reveals about the nature of domination and more specifically the need for domination? Mm. Um, well, uh, the scholar um, E. Francis White has a fantastic article. I wish I could remember the name of the article now. As soon as I get off the Zoom, I'll remember it. Um, which talks about you know, black nationalism, you know, contemporary black nationalism, this moment that I'm talking about, 60s, as a kind of um, double-edged sword uh, in the sense that, um, you know, she recognizes the ways in which um, black nationalism enabled um, African-American activists and thinkers and workers um, the sort of reawakening or uh, revival of black nationalism and the attempt to give um, black nationalist impulses some kind of programmatic uh, expression um, helped uh, black folk to confront some of the uh, shortcomings of, of reformism, some of the shortcomings of, of liberalism, um, and to reject some of the premises of the of Cold War uh, and Cold War thought. Um, but by the same token, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the basic premise of nationhood, right, um, involved reinforcing, re, you know, uh, re, reinscribing um, many of the anti-human um, principles of, of the modern nation state, right? Which is an institution, I mean, you think about the nation state in the 20th century, um, it did a lot of damage, <laughs> right? We're still reeling from that, you know? Um, and even in our kind of you know, transnational globalized moment of the, of the 21st century, um, we're still um, slaughtering one another um, behind the, this abstraction of, uh, of the nation. You know, I, I took my uh, daughter to a um, volleyball game yesterday about an hour away here in upstate New York in a, in a sort of more rural community, even more isolated than uh, Ithaca, New York, where I'm talking to you from. And uh, in this particular town, uh, predominantly white working class town, every other bumper sticker was um, was a, a sort of aggressive expression of of American nationalism, right? Which really is about legitimating um, endless war right? <laughs> um, and imperialism and militarism. And I just thought, my God. <laughs> You know, so um, I guess that was a roundabout way of coming at that, uh, of answering that question. I guess my work tries to understand the, way, the, the dialectic between oppression and liberation and the complex uh, interrelationship. And I mean, you know, I guess my, uh, my purpose is sort of explicitly, um, you know, didactic. I mean, I, I wanna, you know, I think like the historians that I admire, uh, people like Robin Kelly, I came to history because I wanted to understand the past in order to um, build movements, right? And in order to better build movements. So, ah, yes, someone, yes, Professor Dancy provided the, the title of the excellent uh, article, Africa on my mind, gender, counter discourse and African-American nationalism. That's E. Francis White, Africa on my mind. So then the third question for you um, is, what is the role of the K through 12 public education system, if any, in any of these efforts that you were talking about today? Um, you know, that's a good question. It's funny, uh, 
if you get labeled a his, uh, historian of education and people think that, and, and you know, you happen to have a PhD, people think that you're an expert on education. I am not an expert on education. I don't know anything about education. I just happened to do some thinking about how, um, you know, uh, about the sort of relationship in this particular moment of the 60s and 70s, the relationship between sort of formal pedagogy and, uh, and, and black liberation. I mean, look, I think that, um, you know, schools are like every other institution, like every other organ, are expressions of the basic values of the larger society, right? I mean, we, we tend to, I think, idealize schools as, um, as these sort of, um, you know, mechanisms for instilling the best values. But the reality is that the prevailing values um, in our society are gonna be manifest in our uh, schools. I mean, the very structure of the schools, right? Um, how they're uh, funded, how they're um, uh, built uh, and by whom and why <laughs> um, uh, reflects, you know, the, the entrenched um, contradictions of our uh, society. Um, I, I, I have to, I mean, I, you know, even in watching this great film, uh, Aluda Continua, right, the excerpt of which I showed you there at the end. Um, I mean, on one hand, I'm struck by the kind of ro romanticism, right? Like the romance, not, not at all to say that these African-American um, activists who produced the film were uh, naive or, or even idealistic in a negative sense. Um, but there is this kind of romance of the liberated territories and particularly with education as um, as the womb of the new society right you sort of see this this kind of exuberance in for example uh, Che Guevara right and how he talks about the new man in Cuba right and that essay socialism and I think it's socialism and the new man in Cuba um, uh, but I, I have to admit that I you know education, continues to capture my imagination. And I continue to think about education as a realm, as a potential realm of radical um, transformation. Uh, I think the, the key point is that um, schools in of themselves um, are not gonna transform society, right? Schools, what schools generally do is reproduce, you know, the dominant social relations in society. Um, and that's mostly why they exist. Right, um, I think um, formal and informal processes of learning within and beyond the classroom can be a powerful part of um, um, of reconstructing ourselves and reconstructing oppressed people, um, and giving agency to oppressed people so that they themselves can become architects of a new society. But I don't think that ever happens outside of the context of popular struggle. And I think that's the important takeaway from watching a film like A Luta Continua, right? They're not just, um, uh, you know, in the bush, um, you know, hanging a blackboard on a tree because it's romantic. They're doing it because the Portuguese are bombing them. <laughs> They're doing it because they're engaged in a popular struggle. So I'm not at all venerating, uh, I'm not at all valorizing, you know, armed struggle or, or revolution um, or violence necessarily. But what I'm saying is that um, this rethinking of everything, of not only education, but like human relations, right, um, has to happen, I think, in the context of popular struggle. So I'm seeing one more, okay, yes. Uh, so I'm seeing one more question. So it says many of the liberation movements have had a youth component. So for example, uh, the Black Panthers and the UNIA, are there any current Black liberation movements that pay attention to the political education of youth? 
I'm sorry, say that again. I was I got distracted reading the uh the chat. Oh no. <laughs> you asked me about the UNIA. Yeah, so um, many of the liberation movements have had a youth component, so like the UNIA or the Black Panthers. So are there any current Black liberation movements that pay attention to the political education of the youth? Yeah, I'm not sure that there are any that don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there has been, um, you know, I, I think as, uh, as, as many much finer uh, historians of, African American educational traditions um, will will note um, there's there's always been I think a, a tremendous um, uh, impulse within the African American experience um, to redeem the process of learning um, because education was seen rightfully or or, or wrongly um, as um, as a tool for self-liberation and self-emancipation, right? That was the case during the days of slavery. It was the case during um, uh, Reconstruction. It was the case during the long nightmare of, uh, of Jim Crow. Um, it was the case during the, you know, mass um, struggles of the post-World War II years. Um, and in the so-called post-segregation era, it remains the case today. Um, uh, yes, so I mean, I think that, you know, um, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, curricula within the um, classroom, I think that's part of a tradition of the freedom schools and the liberation schools and the kind of Pan-African national schools um, uh, that I mentioned. Um, but I think that there, I think th we do have to, uh, distinguish uh, between multiple political um, tendencies and traditions within African-American uh, educational thought. Um, there's always been a kind of um, a, a bourgeois tradition that um, sees education as a way to create an, um, an African-American elite, right? A professional elite a business elite um, and that uh, sort of points to those figures um, uh, as sort of exemplary of, um, as exemplars of the potential for African-American uh, achievement. Um, you know, so, and, and the black middle class, a large portion of the black middle class has always been very enamored of this uh, approach and the premise is that um, if we can only demonstrate right our capacity, um, then we will ultimately uh, be included and and you know sort of earn or be granted full participation in society. Um, and then there's a there's a um, there's at least another tradition um, that sees. Uh, education as an opportunity for oppressed people um, to confront in a, a concentrated and a, in a rigorous manner um, the lies, right, um, that have helped to uh, to enslave them, um, in order to liberate themselves not only as individuals, but for them to um, understand the responsibility towards a larger project of liberation, of collective emancipation, right? Um, and I think at its best, you know, Black Lives Matter uh, and other movements um, today, other mass movements, um, I think their pedagogical uh, philosophies, their philosophies of education and their pedagogical practices, um, I think draw on this more insurgent and more transformative tradition. So I'm not seeing any other questions, Dr. Rickford. Do you have any final thoughts for us before we close out? Well, I always have final thoughts because I'm a professor. The professors talk all day long. <laughs> That's a very dangerous question to ask a, a academic. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I, I guess I wish I could see uh, folks out in the audience so that we could, you know, interact. Um, but uh, I don't I don't trust myself to just freestyle because, as you can already tell, I'll go off on a tangent. <laughs> no, but thank you so much for uh, speaking with us today and sharing uh, thoughts from your book. It was very informative. I learned a lot. Um, and I hope a lot of the people tuned in learned a lot as well. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, my dear comrade. And, uh, and thank you to Heather as well. I, you know, I was trying to, well, I was looking at the interpreter and trying to speak slow, but then I would speed up again. And then I'd look over and see the interpreter and slow down. But she's doing a fantastic job. Uh, and I'm glad I finally did turn on captions during the, uh, <laughs> during the movie. You can see Aluda Continua, by the way. Um, I think if you just Google it, well, I think I found what I showed you was just on YouTube. It's about 32 minutes long. Um, it's from 1972. I know Professor Dancy has some of his classes uh, watch it, but you all, all in the audience should check it out in its entirety um, if you can and continue to grapple with its um, meaning for our own sort of teaching and learning uh, today. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce the executive director for the Center of Urban Education, uh, Dr. Elon Dancy, to close this out. How are you doing, Dr. Dancy? Um, <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm gonna. I'll let you take the reins from here. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, Dr. Rickford, what a, a rich uh, presentation you gave. Uh, so much there. Indeed, I do show the uh, Luda con uh, Continua uh, video. Uh, so important, uh, I think, for th those of us who are uh, practicing uh, teachers, uh, but for our lives, not only uh, those of us who are working in formalized uh, education, but for our lives. Um, that video shows uh, a reorganized education system, uh, challenges the way that we think about uh, the purposes of education as you have done. And so I just wanna underscore uh, your recommendation about uh, the importance of that uh, video. And I also wanna say that I really appreciated your response to the schools and the school system question. So you don't have to be in an education uh, department, but your critique about uh, schools and um, all of these institutions sort of reflecting uh, the, uh, the interests uh, of the um, society uh, is uh, important and we're uh, challenged to continue to interrogate that relationship um, and to uh, hopefully work uh, in an insurgent way. And your book really helps uh, us to uh, map the coordinates of insurgency. And so I thank you uh, for that. I uh, wanna thank you uh, in general for your thoughtful mind, your intellectual labor here. I uh, wanna thank our graduate student uh, chair, moderator, uh, Cheta Agwomi and our ASL interpreter, uh, Heather Gray. If you're just joining us for the first time, the Center for Urban Education's mantra is learn, share, and transform. Learning speaks to the knowledge we produce. Share speaks to our efforts to share what we know and provide forum for our colleagues to do the same, such as this event, but also our aspirational vision of mutual aid. Transform speaks to our purpose. We are interested in transforming education structures, which requires attention to power and power relations. Our thanks to our center team, particularly Cassia Krogan and Sueño Viveros for their care of this event and our supportive Dean, Dr. Valerie Kinlock. Dr. Rickford's presentation is important for the center, not only for his groundbreaking work, but because as our final lunch and learn of the spring semester, it introduces our theme for our Center for Urban Education Summer Educators Forum. It is Forging Futures Through Black Educational Histories, and it will take place June 16th through the 19th. Our theme invites education historians to join us in dialogues and keynotes that explore Black education imaginations, movements, and purposes, much like Dr. Rickford just did. What can we learn from Black educational freedom struggles and movements in our work and lives? How does this shift our commitments and our praxis, our ways of thinking, our ways of uh, doing work?
our forum aligns to the principle of Sankofa, that we can move forward. We can only forge a future by looking back. This is so important at a time when people use phrases such as get back to school, get back to normal and learning loss. Each of these needs to be challenged and informed with histories of where we have been, where we are and where we're going. I'm very excited for the promise of this year's virtual conference to allow public study of black educational histories as we work to forge futures of self-determination and collective responsibility. The registration will be available very soon. So please keep your eye out for emails, social media messages uh, and announcements and check our website uh, to register for what will be a very rich conference. Finally, know that we regularly update our website. Go to Q, that is C-U-E dot pit dot E-D-U to sign up for our listserv so you can receive news about our events and our other projects. While you're on our website, check out our recent newsletter where you can read about our research, teaching, and service. Thanks so much for attending today. Uh, take good care and be safe.